All right, so we talk about wire transmission methods. So now it is time to talk about wireless transmission methods. So, so we start with microwave line of sight. So this is data transmission in the microwave frequencies between 20 to the 50 megabits per second. Microwave is high frequency form of radio wave with short one centimeter to one megameter uh, wavelength. In this case, the important thing is that it requires line of sight. So if there is a building or a hill between the uh, microwave communication, then you wouldn't have the communication, right? So they are blocked by buildings, hills, and even the curvature of the earth. To overcome obstacles, microwave antennas are often placed on towers or hilltops. Also used in cellular phones and space communications include satellite communications, okay? So uh, transmission through satellites, it allows you like between 10 to the 50 megabits per, per second. So recently, I say recently, but uh, we have to, you know, increase this number maybe a, a few thousands every year because thanks to Starlink, now there are a lot of satellites orbiting around the Earth. And actually these numbers are a little bit, so this is why I left a plus sign here. So, uh, an important uh, family of satellites are geostationary satellites. This orbit the Earth at a velocity to overcome the force of gravity. Orbital speed exactly matches the rotational speed of the Earth. So there is a very specific distance from Earth where you can achieve this. It is uh, 35,786 kilometers. And of course, if you turn it to Mars, it becomes this. So if you send your satellite this to this distance, uh, which is this many kilometers away from the Earth's surface, then you obtain a geostationary satellite. So it uh, has the same speed matching the rotational speed of the Earth. So these satellites seem to hang over a fixed belt on the Earth. So this is why if you want a satellite that's always, you know, uh, direct to, to Turkey, so you can send a, uh, this kind of satellite. Actually, I'll talk about Turksat satellites. I think there are currently six uh, orbiting and functioning Turksat satellites. They are all uh, geostationary satellites. A typical geostationary satellite has several dozen transponders, relay amplifiers, each with a bandwidth of tens of megahertz. There are frequency bands as listed here. I think the last two satellites were KA or KU, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, if you don't send the satellite as a geostation, but if you keep it closer to Earth, now you have you know uh, faster communication, let's say, because the distance is now shorter, but it also has some advantages and disadvantages. We call them low Earth orbit satellites. Remember last week I talked about Starlink and uh, middle Earth orbit satellites. These are all below uh, this distance, 35,000 kilometers. So there was a good attempt by Motorola Iridium. So it was funded by Motorola and Iridium company sent, was planning to send uh, many satellites to obtain a global cell phone service in the 1990s, but it failed due to high service costs compared to the local terrestrial cell phone services. The idea was to send around 80 satellites, but place them in such a geometry that uh, at least one satellite always, I mean, any place on earth always sees a satellite at any given time. This way you connect the whole earth. So six orbits of 11 satellites each, so 66 was enough, but of course you sent like around 80 to have uh, backup satellites in case some of them does not function properly. So several satellites move across the sky over on any location on Earth. Support for almost a quarter of a million conversations. Calls can be relayed from, from satellite to satellite. So this way you connect the whole Earth uh, for GSM communication actually. Of course it failed, but then uh, Iridium next project actually continued where it would stop. 
So in 2016, a second generation worldwide network of telecommunication satellites were uh, sent. And this time SpaceX uh, was responsible for the launches. I think satellites were produced by Thales. So between uh, 2017 and 2019, I was teaching this course. I always uh, updated the slides. So uh, a few years ago, we uh, this project completed. So now, uh, as I mentioned last week, we have actually uh, Iridium Next, which actually uh, doesn't matter at which spot on Earth you are, if you have a proper device, you can co communicate via satellite. So this is actually a huge success. I mean, a historical success because now you actually provide communication to whole Earth. Okay, so there are some transmission uh, challenges through satellites. The one is propagation delay, substantial time necessary for a satellite message to travel. Depends on, of course, the distance of the satellite and the band it is using and so on. This delay makes satellite transmission unsuitable for time communication protocols, for example, Ethernet. So this is a little bit old slide. So this is why I didn't erase this sentence because Nowadays, actually, Starlink is a good uh, solution for this kind of problems. So actually, Starlink provides good throughput, more than 50 megabits per second. In Ukraine, during the invasion, uh, users reported around 200 megabits per second. And there's a very low latency, like 50 milliseconds, which is enough for even online gaming. But since satellites are in motion, uh, your satellite is actually uh, is a little bit clever. So as the satellite moves, your dish also rotates a little bit so that it keeps communication with the satellite. But when the satellite is over the horizon, the dish actually turns the other way around to connect to another satellite. So this kind of switches between satellites can cause momentary disruption. If you are using it for regular internet purposes, probably you wouldn't notice it, but it wouldn't be suitable for online gaming in this scenario, but still, you, know, you can live with that. So, I mean, you can use uh, satellites for this kind of communication to give the short answer. Another security problem, satellites cannot be aimed. Therefore, they broadcast their messages to an entire hemisphere. Anyone with the appropriate receiver can intercept the transmission. If security is a concern, some sort of encryption must be employed. But don't forget that encryption is free. Both in you know talking about patents, you, you don't need to pay money to use an encryption algorithm, but also in terms of computational uh, challenges, encryption is really free. It's so fast that you wouldn't notice. I mean, nowadays you can uh, encrypt hundreds of gigabits per second so this is a really huge speed. So your actual hard drives are not that fast to write it to hard drive, right? So this is not much of a problem. Okay, the third one is transmission through cellular systems. Signals travel between a cell phone and the local base station antenna, which is hardwired into the public switch telephone network. So maybe we should give a stop here and talk about this. So everybody almost now have a, a mobile phone. So you are connected to the closest base station and you are a mobile, you are maybe in a car or walking. So actually, if you get close to another base station, you actually change the base, uh, base station you are talking to. This is also sometimes causes a small disruption in the communication, but not, I mean, in older times it was easy to detect, but I think nowadays it is not that much of a problem. But here the problem is that uh, this currently does not provide you an end-to-end -end encryption. Normally, uh, your voice should be encrypted on your phone, should transmit it to all of these, uh, you know, wired and wireless transmission channels and reach to the person you are talking to, and it should be decrypted there. This way, we would have an end-to-end -end encryption. But of course, uh, this would be secure for users, but uh, governments uh, doesn't want that because if you provide such a system, then you know terrorists can also use that system, right? So this is why you should be 
there should be countermeasures for government so that whenever it is necessary, the, you know, have the appropriate uh, documents, you should be able to tap in and listen to the communication. This is why actually uh, what you're doing is as follows. Your phone and the base station actually uses an encryption algorithm. So at the base station, the base station can decrypt it and it, it sends uh, the data in a wide way to the, you know, the GSM company. So some of them actually doesn't even uh, encrypt through this wired communication, thinking that uh, nobody will be able to tap in and listen to, which is actually against GDPR, by the way, or KBKK in Turkey. All right, so I want to give a small update about security in GSM communication. And if you are using an old mobile phone or you are connected to your old base station, or for some reason GSM company wants it, you may use a old encryption algorithm, A51, which can be actually uh, decrypted and listened in real time. So and actually you don't know which encryption algorithm you are using because your mobile phone generally doesn't let you know this kind of properties. All right. So let's continue with the definitions. A geographic region such as a city or suburb is divided into geographic subregions called cells. A base station at the center of each cell. Nearby base stations are wired into a switching computer, the mobile switching center, or short as MSC, that provides a path to the telephone network. So this is what actually damaged in uh, during the Kahraman Marash case that I talked about last week. So. If at the center of each cell, you have a base station generally put on top of buildings, apartment buildings. But if the apartment collapses, then your base station also collapses. This is uh, so, but at this point, uh, I don't know if you can blame the GSM company because they put the base station there thinking that the building was built properly, right? It shouldn't collapse during an earthquake if it were, you know, built according to law. So when necessary connectivity is changed from one base station to an adjacent one, namely handoff. Again, this is what I mentioned. If you're traveling in a car, you know, you will be changing the base station in a frequently. So handoff occurs many times. All right. So let's move on to ad hoc networks, which I said that might be a good solution when we have natural disasters. So these are dynamic decentralized self configuring networks. No pre-existing infrastructure. This is important because I said that you know we lost the infrastructure during the earthquake. This is the, actually the good thing about ad hoc networks. They don't need a, an existing infrastructure. For example, no routers in managed wired ad hoc networks or no access points in managed wired networks. Each node participates in routing by forwarding data for other nodes based on the dynamics of network connectivity and the routing algorithm in use. Okay, these are also known as multi hub radio networks. Sample application of ad hoc networks can be listed as mobile ad hoc networks, shortened as MANETs, also known as wireless ad hoc network or ad hoc wireless networks. In this case, you know, mobile nodes communicate with each other. If you do it with vehicles, so instead of using your mobile phone or your laptop, you your vehicle has a uh, communication capacity, so vehicles communicate with each other, used for instant communication between vehicles and roadside equipment. So there is, this is a, a major research topic for AI because you want to share data so that if there is a, a traffic jam or something, you want to warn other people so that they use other uh, routes. But you also want to keep your privacy because you don't, if you announce there that there's a traffic jam at this coordinate, this means that you, you show that you are in that coordinate, right? So this is against your privacy. So you can, there are some methods to both provide privacy, but also information sharing like this. So this is a good research topic area. Smartphone ad hoc networks. Employ smartphones to create peer-to-peer -peer networks without relying on cellular carrier networks, wireless access points, or traditional network infrastructure. For example, multi-peer ad hoc mesh networking capabilities since Apple iOS 7.0. So this is important because uh, this is what I want to say. Uh, uh, during the earthquake, uh, the people 
at the site can create such a network with their mobile phones so that they could communicate with each other. Because in the Karaman Marash earthquakes, it covered a very, very huge area, 11 cities. When combined, it is an area larger than most of the European countries, right? It is a huge area. So, uh, and if you don't have the infrastructure, you cannot even communicate to a person that is one kilometer away from you. But if we created such a smartphone ad hoc network, actually we could communicate, the rescue personnel could communicate with each other and they could also communicate with people that are, you know, uh, trapped inside collapsed buildings. There are other uh, ad hoc networks, like you can Army and Navy Tactical Monets, Air Force Unmanned Aerial Vehicle ad hoc networks, which are very popular these days because we have uh, very good drones. The technology is really improved in that area, really fast, and we have unmanned aerial vehicles. So creating an ad hoc network with that, sometimes a very good idea. But of course, uh, in the case of drones, uh, the air conditions and the battery power is a limiting factor. You cannot uh, fly a drone for 24 hours, right? But for unmanned aerial vehicles, since they are bigger and better capacities, you can do create this kind of ad hoc networks. Ad hoc home smart lighting to control lights over a smartphone or via computer. In this case, you use like Zigbee, and these are actually ad hoc networks, which actually does not rely on a pre-existing infrastructure. So this is the good thing about ad hoc networks, and actually you can create nice uh, applications. And you know, as I mentioned earlier, a good uh, application for such a ad hoc network that we can use during uh, disaster, nature disasters, and so on, would be a nice idea. Okay, but uh, let's move on to security, since this course is called Network Security. Most wireless ad hoc networks do not implement any network access control, vulnerable to resource consumption attacks. A malicious node inject packets into network for depleting the resources of the nodes relaying the packets. So think about this way, like five people connected to each other with this mobile phone, let's say. So one of the person participating might send, you know, uh, uh, many packets which are actually just uh, meaningless packets. And this way you can actually a run down the battery of all of the people included in the network since they will be transmitting all of these packets to each other and so on. Even with the authentication vulnerable to packet dropping or delaying attacks, an intermediate node drops the packet or delays it rather than sending it to the next stop. This is also important because uh, the topology changes since this is a mobile ad hoc network you are moving. So sometimes a person might be actually connecting two different uh, groups. So every data will be transmitted uh, through this node. So that node, if once it might drop the packets and this way or delay them so that they can cause a problem. So here uh, you have to, it is very hard to create a good secure system without trust. So this is also a nice research area. Let's move on to the last one, wireless sensor networks. These are, uh, this is a research topic for a very long time now, WSN. A group of specially dispersed and dedicated sensors for monitoring and recording the physical conditions of the environment and organizing the collected data at a central location. WSNs measure environmental conditions like temperature, sound, pollution levels, humidity, wind, and so on. So the figure below shows the typical multi-top wireless sensor network architecture. So your gateway is here. So this node, for instance, measures temperature, but this uh, has a you know the Wi-Fi wireless capacity is just a small circle here, so it cannot send data to the gateway due to distance. So this network actually provides a path for the this node to communicate to gateway. So for instance, this way from hopping between the nodes, the data is sent from here to here. So as you can see, there might be many uh, security problems that you need to consider. 
for instance, this node might not send it. This node might be a malicious node. Maybe it is not a node that you put it on the field, but a malicious person put it there. It can modify the data and so on. So, uh, but it is a very useful area. Another security issue is that most of the time the sensors are put on the field. So the attacker might have a physical access to the device and you know tamper with the device and so on. So each node is connected to a sensor. A typical wireless sensor unit has the following characters, characteristics. They are very small. They size from one millimeter to one centimeter, weigh less than 100 grams, cost less than a dollar, data rate in the range of 100 bits per second to 100 kilobits per second. Power consumption less than a very small watt, you know. So, Wireless personal area network Bluetooth this transceivers consumes more than 1,000. So think about it in this way, because this is a device you are planning to put on the field, right? And you don't want to change the battery all the time. So it should consume very small amount of power. This way you don't need to, you know, update it all the time. These are also known as dust networks, by the way first scattered all around the area. So similar to wireless ad hoc networks in that rely on wireless connectivity, spontaneous formation of networks so the sensor data can be transported wirelessly. In case of control of the sensors through bidirectional links, wireless sensor and actuator networks, WSAS, actually this leads us to the you know internet of things, which are more which is a more popular term today, which I'm going to talk about next. Sample application domains, any kind of monitoring application, for example, homes for climate control, biomedical applications such as glucose level monitoring, monitoring beach pollution, etc. And actually, currently, we are, uh, our university is running this kind of project in the Amer Lake that is inside our you know, uh, university boundaries. So there are many, many applications and many, many uh, use cases, but there are also many security concerns and problems that need to be solved in these uh, wireless communication uh, methods. <clears throat> 